Derek here. This is Chris. And we're recording our first Class 4 podcast here at Chris's base camp up mm-hmm. in Walden, Vermont. Awesome. So, little introductions. I'm Derek, and I am the founder of the pilgrimage event. Um, a little back history on this event is it started from the, I guess we'll say ashes of VOBS, and then before that, Vermont Overland. And I've, this is what got me into actual overlanding is running this event and going to this event. And I've been into Land Rovers and other random military vehicles for 15, 20 years before that. Yeah, and I'm Chris. Um, I've basically just watched Derek collect amazing vehicles, and I've never lived anywhere where I could truly enjoy them. Uh, so a few years ago, when I got back to Vermont, um, I was really able to join Derek in some of these events, check out some of the vehicles, and then get one of my own. Yeah, in a little bit, once we're done talking about the pilgrimage and the history of the Class 4 roads, we're going to do a walk-around audio tour of Chris's amazing 110 that has evolved because of the pilgrimage events. Changes color every year. So, first off, let's talk about what is, what's the pilgrimage to you? Like, so instead of it just me talking about my event, what's the pilgrimage to you who's, who's seen it grow and change and, and it actually is an attendee? Yeah, so I've been to the pilgrimage the last two years. Um, and, you know, before that, started riding the trails with Derek. Um, going to the pilgrimage for the first time, I wasn't sure what to expect. I went there to have fun, to camp out, relax, unwind from work and those stressors. Um, when I got there, it was just amazing to see all the vehicles, the different people, and just how fun everyone had uh, while they attended this event. Um, I had the opportunity to lead some groups, hand out goat cheese and butter. Oh my God, the cheese is... <laughs> so this is an inside pilgrimage tip. Go over to Chris's Vermont Cream. Well, you should buy Vermont Creamery products anyways, but go over to his Vermont Creamery stand and just sample some of the most amazing <laughs> goat cheese. But if you can, the, what is it? The restaurant quality butter yeah. will completely destroy your butter experience going forward because nothing is as good as that. No, nope. you just eat it straight and it changes oh, your life. Oh my God. Um, I also... Highly recommend the Cremont, which is my favorite. Chris has given me some Cremont after this visitation up here, filming the strip. But yeah, so Chris has come as a vendor and gotten from my crewmen involved to help us. And that has been amazing. But one of the things that I like about the event is it's changed from when I was going to VOBS because I really got into what was formerly the, the similar style event, Vermont Overland Birdwatching Safari in its later stages, starting in about 2017. And I've more, I took what I saw, because it was a great event. Um, Peter Volors had an excellent formula, and he he is responsible for really all these maps. He's the one who hit all the class four roads and categorized them and color coded them for difficulty, which we'll go over what, because that's the question we always get is. Is my vehicle good enough for this? Yeah, and what do these colors mean? Yeah. Um, but going from there, the things that I took out of it, I was attending with a family, and as the event went on, it was a little less family oriented and more dedicated on the more hardcore wheeling aspect and the self-navigation, which is great, but it kind of excluded a lot of the people who are newer to overlanding and exploring Vermont. Um, so when I took over the, the, uh, the property, because I bought... Peter Volor's house in 2020, um, and then took over the business that really we decided to make it our own and and not use any of the Vermont Overland names. And the Vermont Overland went its separate ways um, with Ansel running the bike side of it and now the running side of it. Um, it just made sense for it to be to be its own. And the thing that made me think about it is what what do we call it? And we went through so many different names, and I thought of what is this event to a lot of people and people will come from all over the country and it is a pilgrimage to vermont every fall to see the fall foliage to hang out with amazing people meet new people around the campfire and just have an incredible time on the class four roads which is what makes this event possible yeah i just want to reiterate you know a point derek made about it um 
being more open to either newcomers or families. Uh, I didn't have a background in this. I owned an uh, old Nissan Xterra just to get to the mountains in California before this. And didn't know anything about self-recovery or recovery or how to drive on some of the different technical terrain. And the great thing is, is no one at these events is too good to share their knowledge, to lend a hand, to make those 1 a.m. rescue trips. Um, oh, yeah, we did a couple of those. <laughs> Point of advice, don't do the crack on a Friday night. Just is about to get dark in a single vehicle. Those guys did an awesome job of self-recovering with two flat tires, bunch of body damage, two broken windows. They winched like miles, I think. They, they winched their awesome, but like wheel, wheel with a group, or if you're gonna do the crazy stuff, do it at a time when someone else is, if you're gonna do it alone, do it at a time when someone else is probably gonna come down that trail, yeah. right? I'm happy to come and help you out and the community loves it, I swear. We all live for it, like it's a rescue mission. We, you know, it might as well be the Sante raid the way everyone gets pumped up. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's wheel responsibly, wheel with a group if you can, or have the confidence to self recover and the abilities. Yeah, and kind of on that too, right? Like. Let's talk about Vermont and the community here and these yeah. class four roads, right? Like these are shared roads open to the public, but rarely maintained and at varying degrees of difficulty. Yep. Um, you know, they go through, they cut through people's yards. They cut through uh, different towns, property lines, um, over mountains, over mountains, through rivers R rivers have now yes they were it's so you're not driving up a river for the sake of driving up a river waterways have now formed on some of these roads especially when it's wet so you are legal to drive we don't ever encourage people driving up and down rivers or bodies of water that are not um you know part of the road system but yeah you go from anything to like this is a normal dirt road in anywhere into the country to something like the crack and you're like how was this ever a road you're like what what happened here <laughs> and at the same time you go from full cell phone service to none for miles uh you go from oh yeah <laughs> fuel stops and food to again nothing as you cut across the mountain ranges and you know it's just important to keep uh that in mind making sure you have the right stuff with you uh knowing kind of what your path is going to be uh, so that you can plan appropriately and restock along the way as appropriate. And the cool thing with this event is it's it's a guide your own tour mystery book. Like it's what you can do whatever you want to do at the Pelican Ranch. And that's one of the reasons I love it is you can show up in a completely stock whatever it is, new defender, old Bronco, 1947 Willie's Jeep, anything and still stay within your capabilities and have the comfort of knowing that these trails have been pre well they're not trails the class war has been pre-run so you're never going to get yourself into a situation that's beyond your vehicle's capabilities and more important your driving abilities um and then because it's such a community event if you don't have anyone to ride with come over to the staff desk and we'll help you find someone else who wants to go do similar things or we'll take you out on one of the guided the guided stuff that the staff does, or some of our amazing vendors like OEX, Northeast Adventure Company, they come out and offer their, their guide services for free. Like going out and going wheeling with the OEX guys who are probably the best off-road driving instructors in the world. These are the guys who train tier one level guys for the military. That is, that is not a cheap thing You'd be paying good money, and I highly encourage you to get the training, just like anything. Go down and take a class, whether it's OEX or whoever. Um, but that's a huge perk that you can go out and get the instruction from these guys for free and meet them and demo the product. It's, it's a huge perk, and right, it then allows you to go the rest of the year a little more comfortably on your own. Oh, yeah, totally. Right? Like, I've learned so much. So when I got into this, I was really only comfortable with greens and blues. I just was. I was driving really old vehicles. I was driving a night. So the first couple VOBSs, I was in a 1978 Land Rover ambulance. And I had no idea how to use the maps. I was terrified. I had a dog with me. 
two kids and my wife, no idea how to use the maps. And the community that took me in and showed me where to go was a group of Suzuki Samurais, <laughs> which you ever get a chance to go wheeling with the Suzuki Samurais guys is hilariously fun because the way they tackle all these obstacles with just raw power and the ability to just hop over everything because they weigh like 300 pounds is awesome. But it was so cool to be cruising down these class four roads and doing water crossings. And there's a pack of five Suzuki Samurais and one big Land Rover ambulance. But I had the confidence knowing that if I had a problem, I wasn't out there alone. I wasn't going to die in the Vermont wilderness. And that's not going to happen up here. We, these, these are, we, we do the pre-running and grade the class four. So that way, you know what you're getting into. Yeah. And we really, again, we always encourage you to go out and, and do it with friends and make friends. I've made so many friends who are now lifelong friends that are, are nearly family just through meeting them at VOBS, like Brady, Laz, Ned, Chris, Lloyd, all those dudes that I just met around the campfire talking and and just cruising the class four roads with um that's the thing i love it the other thing that's cool about this event versus a lot is it is a bring anything you want event there is no right or wrong way to do this event regardless of the vehicle you have so long as you are having a good time or or to that point like you don't have to be a millionaire for this event oh good god no right <laughs> i mean we have we have a bunch of them, but no, you do not need to be a millionaire. Um, I like watching the weird stuff. And again, if people can start bringing the cooler, older, weird stuff, I, my big goal is one day to see someone come in like a model Ford, like tier a that was originally cruising these class four roads. Like I'd love to see a pre-war truck doing these trucks. Cause like, that's why I buy a lot of, you know, I collect really weird stuff like uaz 469s <laughs> and old land rovers and stuff and um uh, i love doing the greens and the blues and this old stuff that is wildly not capable but hilariously fun because it makes those what would be a boring trail on a built-up jk or a unimog fun um and that's the big thing like we have sam who's one of our friends who comes in this amazing subaru you would never think a subaru would be on these class four roads and sam brings it every year and just puts a lot of people to shame because he will go down these obstacles and just go into them complete confidence and doing stuff i see guys with built up rigs hesitating because he knows his vehicles and he's driving within his comfort limits and it's awesome to see and it's cool when you're just sitting in the pilgrimage venue watching you know if you're into forerunners or land cruisers seeing them come in and then you'll see the unimogs go by or brady's six-wheeled Pinzigauer or Jerry's 1947 Jeep, which is so far the oldest vehicle we've had come to the pilgrimage. Seeing all that, that stuff. going and tested half oh these trails, God. pre yeah, the Jerry, trails with yeah, us. And... Jerry is a, uh, we'll do a podcast with Jerry because he is, I'm an original Vermonter, but Jerry is the original Vermonter. Uh, I think he was the first one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also the most helpful pr- I am beyond lucky to have Jerry as a neighbor. I joke that when I'm doing stuff around the house or when I get stuck, because whenever I get stuck behind the house, Jerry just appears with a chainsaw and the Jeep and gets me out. <laughs> um, it's, but that's the relationships you build with the pilgrimages. You see all these cool rigs, so you can go wheeling with anything. Last year, I went out and led a, just a fun run to get a creamy. I was in an old British Special Forces Land Rover. We had... A Porsche Cayenne with us, which yep. was crazy capable. A Touareg, uh, some sort of expedition. Can- I I don't know the vans that well. I really don't know. We had a nine thousand pound van with us. That was four wheel drive, doing amazing on the greens. What I, I think we had a, like a Land Cruiser with it. It was just such a, a weird collection of vehicles that you would never see at like Jeep Jamboree or a Land Rover only event. It's just cool to see that stuff i think that's what i really appreciated like this last year when i was kind of leading a group each day i I never knew what vehicles what capabilities or any of that and so it's kind of cool to see who lined up talking to the folks right getting a sense of who they were and what they wanted to do and and then kind of building out a route from there yep and yeah i just remember the last day just 
yeah, I was driving back up home and leading a group that also lived up in northern Vermont, and uh, I had two full-size trucks. I had a Ram and a Tundra that were built up for overland. Oh, yeah, the pickup trucks have come a long way. Yeah. We have a bunch more of the modern American pickup trucks coming, and I was really surprised where I never thought that one of those trucks could wheel as well as they did. No, I thought the muddy spots were going to get them every yeah, time, right? Yeah, no, sinking it's, in and... that stuff has come a long way. You broke down and they helped you. Yep, yep. I lost my uh, front drive shaft on yep. that one, went down to two-wheel <laughs> drive for the remainder of that trail. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, Ian Ackerman of uh, Ackerman Maple Syrup actually hit here in Cabot. Yep, yep, yep. Um, he's used to, you know, working the land and working on his own stuff when it breaks and he hopped down there with me. He had his whole family in the tundra and uh, helped me get it removed completely after one end broke off uh, just so we could get out of there. And um, that's the cool thing with the event is, so it's kind of a big safety net. So what we say is, if you have a problem, get into the Facebook group and post up where you are, what's going wrong, and that everyone who's at the event is going to see that and we will get you help. Yeah. And even whether it's just getting you to the road so you can get towed or getting a trail fix. Yeah. There are so many better wrench turners than you and I at these events and everyone wants to help. Yeah. You'll get Brady out of the river and uh, back in his pins to go find you. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my pins blew a clutch last year. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, or like just all this stuff, the safety net of just having the ability, Knowing that if something goes wrong with a vehicle mechanically, we will get you out. The community will get you out. And then you can still have an amazing time at the event and just ride past you. We've had a bunch of people just ride past you. Yeah. Um, and that's loads of fun. I actually am getting to the point where I really enjoy riding passenger now at the event because I, I can socialize more and I'm not focusing on driving or having to run my vehicles and all that. And, um, there's something special about seeing someone hit these these roads for the first time and oh yeah yeah you know, just that smile on their face after they make it over oh. an obstacle and just and then like you've had this amazing experience all day whether you're going around to lawson's or you want to make the crazy hike up the hill farmstead or or whatever or you want to go search for the perfect maple creamy or the views uh, which is up here in walden the perfect <laughs> maple is. creamy i will butch's 100... harvest store butch's harvest store is the best maple creamy in vermont it's on the maps it is worth the trip up here and if especially if you have kids you can stop at the orchard along the way up yeah like bert's apple orchard um, great place the northeast kingdom especially if you've been going to vo or vobs for a while take the time and head up into the kingdom because we've added a lot more towns up there we're getting ready to do another round of exploring this year and adding some towns yep. um it's a bunch of cool stuff that hasn't been run to death if you've been to the events before um, uh, Derek and I found that out last year, you know, we were, uh, trying to map out some of them and we struck out a bunch, but we also found some amazing trails. We found the pit of poor decisions. That's oh sure. my God. Yes. The pit of poor decisions was, uh, a bad we, day to wear sandals. It was a bad day to wear sandals. And at one point when we had three different vehicles stuck going in different directions, winching out in both directions, winching out in both directions. And there was no good line. That's why it's called the pit of poor decisions. Cause you think there's a good line and there's not, it's just, a, and it's, it's very wide. Yeah. So, so it's deceiving where you could find, but, um, we were, we were helped out by a bunch of locals in Jeeps in yep. Jeeps. And they felt super confident. They're going to make it through and immediately got bogged down with us, which was <laughs> awesome. Um, but like that sort of stuff is is cool, and it's marked "pay to poor decisions" pink, so you know that like, hey, I probably shouldn't take my Subaru through that or my stock red. Uh, but to finish up the event, the after you've had this amazing day out in the class fours, you come back to the venue at Henderson's Hideaway. You want goat cheese? You want coach cheese, and it's right along the White River. It's beautiful, and the way I've set it up is. It's not just an event about overlanding everything else. I want to really showcase what Vermont is. And how I do that is bringing out the best local Vermont products, be it Vermont Creamery, be it with the distillers we worked with, Vermont Spirits last year. We've got a couple of distillers we're getting for this year. Um, the amazing food renders, Taco wow. Truck All-Stars. We, we want it to be so you don't have to go anywhere. 
come and hang out. If you want to buy on the Thursday night, we're bringing in another local farm to sell meats and eggs and maple cool. syrup. You can't beat it. So you can just grill at the campsite. And then if all else goes wrong and you don't want anything there, the town of South Royalton is a mile down the road. With a, you can go visit Worthy Burger, which is a must stop anyways. Yes. Our friend Jason, who's been doing the class four roads for eons um, and does it in the coolest new glad diesel gladiator, which I didn't have a lot of respect for until I've done a bunch of time wheeling to gladiators is amazing. Especially with his diesel, he's getting like 18 miles per gallon on 37s. It's really? insane. Um, and he's been a huge sport event. So definitely check him out at Worthy Burger and Worthy Kitchen. Worthy Kitchen, you need reservations though. That's in Woodstock. Worthy Burger, you do not in South Royalton. <clears throat> so anyways, you have this amazing experience. We do an ice cream sundae bar for the kids on the... Uh, and adults. And the adults, yeah. So I'm, I'm an inner and outer <laughs> fat kid. We do that on the Thursday night. Friday night, we do a cigar bar. Um, I'm smoking a Gurkha 21 cigar right now. That is my vice. If uh, anyone ever wants to bring me gifts, I love I love cigars. Um, mild, mild to medium, not spicy. Um, but we do the cigar bar, and it's all stuff that I smoke, and it's it's free. And then on the Saturday night for the kids, we do the pumpkin carving. Yep. Um, and that's, I want it to be completely family friendly. It's dog friendly event too. It is, yeah. So a lot of you guys got to meet Grizzly, who was uh, my dog, who was going around the wolfhound, who followed me from campfire to campfire to campfire for like five hours every night last event. Um, and it is whatever you want this event to be. If you want to wheel all day and into the evening, awesome. Yep. If you just want to have a casual pace and come in a, VW van and just cruise some of like the more tame class four roads or even just the dirt roads and then enjoy the atmosphere at the at the venue. Awesome. There's no right or wrong way to do this as long as you are having fun. That's what it comes down to. Um, and it's open to anybody. Um, so I really look forward to showing this event with you. I think we spent enough time on the event. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the class four roads and the maps. All right. So you tell me about your history with the Class 4 Roads and something about it. Yeah, so Class 4 Roads, to me, kind of growing up, there weren't a ton in my immediate area. I was in Chittenden County, just south of Burlington. Um, but, you know, you head to the town south where Derek grew up, um, and you start finding them. And then you start finding... There was a whole one in Sherlock. Yeah. There was a whole one. <laughs> Let's we... be honest. <laughs> but, but right, like, now in the Northeast Kingdom... Oh, it's Google Maps tries to take me down them sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes in my wife's Hyundai, um, you know, hybrid. That's always a blast. Yep. Uh, usually don't get very far down. And uh, but it's really cool. You get to see basically how the state was built ahead of time. Um, yes. You've probably heard of like the stone walls along, you know, property lines in Vermont and stuff. You know, a lot of that is when the land was being cleared. But the big stones, they kind of started piling up along the border so that their land was more tillable yep. uh, for the crops. And so it's really cool because you can actually see the outlines of what's now like. What is now straight up old forest, growth forest, like old growth forest. Yeah. And there's a stone wall that's running for miles through. And you're like, who built this? Yeah, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, like... it's so cool to see. And then you take another turn onto another class four road and there's an old cemetery. Yeah, um, yeah, an old cemetery that had some open graves, which was wildly disturbing. That was up in, that was up here in the kingdom, um, or the cellar holes. So, yep. as as a lot of you know, my passion is the history. I love the history, be it the cellar holes, the gold mine and ghost tour stuff, and then coming from my aviation side, from where I used to be in the Air Force and I was a pilot, um, aviation archaeology and the aviation history of Vermont, and the Class Four roads go to all these places. Yep. It's pretty crazy that the reason they're there particularly down where i am in southern vermont is because a lot of the towns that these roads serve don't exist anymore yep. so just up the road for me at the base of some class four roads is was the old town of reading that doesn't exist it sunk in and it had a hotel brothel you know general store everything and it just ceased to exist but the road's still down there or when we go out to plymouth to the what we call the ghost town that was a whole 
functioning town that just disappeared because it turns out Vermont gold mining was um, not a real thing. Yeah, there wasn't quite the boom that California had in the yeah, 1850s. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that when we actually, if you come up and do the ghost mining tour or the, uh, the gold mine tour and the treasure tour, because there's another story of that, and do some panning up here. But I love the history side of it, and these Class 4 roads are history. And the cool thing about what makes it possible in Vermont is these roads are protected, and the reason we could map them all out, well, really, Peter started mapping them all out, is they showed up on VTrans maps and were marked. And... But warning, you can't just take a Vermont V-Trans map and take it for gospel that these roads still exist. Nope. Last year when we were up here, well, we ran into a road that just like and natural it. forest just like started appearing. You could kind of vaguely see where it was with their tre trees that were obviously 80 years old yep. in the middle of the road. And like, they may be on the maps, but they're not there. And that's the big reason why we pre-run them. Yeah, there's one time I was just driving through Cabot on my own with my wife and, uh, Thought I was turning onto a class four and ended up just being in a farmer's field and ended up swimming in the guy's pond with him. Um, fortunately, he was nice enough to, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of see what I was trying to do. And that's, told me that's the, the thing. Um, so speaking of that, class four roads courtesies. Yeah. So the big thing that I really try to get across to everybody is these roads are shared. So Ness, not a lot of people are driving on them but you will see loads of people walking on them, particularly down where I am in Southern Vermont, down the Woodstock area, you will see a lot of horses on them. I growl ride them. Gr or, gr yeah, the bikes. The bike is a huge thing, especially up here in the kingdom now. Yep. Um, with the rail trail and everything. Be courteous to everyone you come across. If you come across horses or people walking dogs, pull over, let them go by. Yep. Um, talk to them, engage them in conversation. Um, you are not only a representative for yourself. You are a representative for the whole overlanding community. You're representative for anyone who's out in these road and wheel vehicles and a representative for the event. And sometimes you're gonna come across people that don't want you there and just respect that. And if you come across a class four that is blocked, just turn around. It's not worth getting into. Yes, the roads are legally protected under the state of Vermont. There is up to a thousand dollar fine if they are blocked. Um, by anything other than a logging equipment that was there temporarily. Um, but I've taken a, a couple of class four roads off of the maps just because the, the people that lived at either end of them were just so anti, anti anyone using them. It wasn't worth the, the hostility that you coming to the event would have to deal with. And those are very few and far between. Very. And there's 1700 miles or more of class four roads in Vermont. It doesn't matter if we lose a road um, to someone who doesn't want us there. There's plenty of stuff to experience and see. So, again, just be courteous. Um, and the other thing we're starting to see a lot more of is the adventure bikers. Really be courteous with them. Because remember, they may take a lot more momentum to go up and down an obstacle. And they're going to generally be at a higher speed than we may be cruising at to keep that bike upright. Especially if they're in a proper adventure bike, like a heavy BMW or KTM. They get a bunch of kid on because those guys are like properly straight up overlanding. They are, everything they own is on that bike. That is legit. And even as a mountain biker, right? I could tell you that the, the speed, the momentum is what gets you over those things. It's not always that perfect line or taking your time. Sometimes you just need to, to gun it and go for it. Um, and the other thing we need to talk about here, we're also sharing the roads with is the wildlife. Yes. Okay. There is a lot of wildlife out on the class four roads. What did we it, see coming down to camp today? Oh, turkey. Yep. Um, black bears were at last, at last uh, pilgrimage. Year before that was moose. Uh, we're always seeing deer. Grouse. Um, grouse. But like, you, the more, the deeper you get into the woods, the more you're going to encounter them. These animals aren't dumb. They use these roads <laughs> to get around. Um, so always be courteous. Always keep your head on a swivel. Um, and you want to see these, these wildlife anyways. It's the, fun. The other threat that can change class four roads unpredictably, as I found out last year, is beavers. Yeah. I love beavers, but they have a tendency of erecting dams very quickly or destroying dams very quickly, thus flooding out a road that I'd pre-run a month before. That is now when you're leading a green ride and now everyone's fording a foot of water because the beavers decided they're going to dam this new section. The, the first time I was ever part of a recovery, Derek, was actually when uh, oh, we slid ambulance. into a B 
beaver yeah. pond. Um, and we'd forgotten the chainsaw, so yeah. we couldn't go farther. Um, that's a whole nother story of, <laughs> of like, we spent like an hour trying to cut that giant tree with an ax, yep. uh, hedging saw that we had winching it and nothing moved it. And then I got stuck. Luckily you were able to get around me with only the middle of body contact. And get the damage. Um, uh, but you're, you're going to experience wildlife and there are going to be some natural hazards. So. Um, trees do come down out here in the woods. Trees fall in the woods. That's the type of stuff. So it's always better to be with a group. Hopefully someone has a chainsaw, but we really heavily pre run the stuff. So, and most of it gets cleared. The ATV guys are out there. The side by sides guys are out there. Yeah. The vast trail guys are out there, particularly in the spring, clearing it up. And, um, that's one of the be, be responsible for, for the roads. Just remember too, 1700 miles spread out across yeah. all these different sections and yeah you know, that means derek's starting to pre-run them you know as soon as the trail's open may 15th so, so and some towns open earlier but the general rule of thumb is don't go out on these trails because we're giving you the maps so the first time this year before the event we're giving them on may 15th oh that's amazing don't go out on mud season like and the other huge thing which i have to say and this comes from our friends the game more and everything else do not go on the little bypasses on the sides of the trails. Those are not part of the class four roads. Some of those are actually protected uh, water habitats. So you could get a very hefty ticket from a game warden or get into a ticket from the Department of Natural Resources. And um, we wanna be courteous, pick up any trash you come across. We're gonna give you a trail trash bag to every person that comes. If you fill up one, we'll give you plenty more. We have a dumpster back at the campsite. Please look after these roads. Yes, they are protected, but we are the stewards of them along with all the other communities that share these these class four roads because it's hard to carry a chainsaw or a bag of trash when you're on a bike or on a horse. So um, just, be, just be respectful of the roads and keep Vermont green. Today's actually green up there here in Vermont. It is, which yep. is a, which is a fitting day to do this and talk about this. I think my wife and I picked up uh, seven bags full of garbage. Oh, I know my kids are my kids are policing Bailey Mills Road right now, and it, and it might seem silly, right? Like, oh, you know, why are there all these rules and regulations and stuff like that? But that's also what keeps Vermont special. Yes, it's what keeps Vermont green. It's what keeps you know this natural habitat that is so fun to ride through. You're and you're doing it in literally the peak foliage so that the reason i moved the pilgrimage to that first week in october is in september it really we weren't at you had some turning of the leaves but like that weekend in october generally we are at peak or just before it, and the colors are amazing and just cruising down these these roads with the leaves blowing it it's some of the most beautiful it's my favorite season in Vermont, but it's like some of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. And you get to this overlook and it could be seeing Okemo, it could be up here in the kingdom. You can see all the way to Mount Washington or just coming across the perfect brook um, that you want to stop and do some fly fishing in. Remember, if you're going to do any fishing, get a Vermont state license. license. The game wardens are out there. They're incredibly nice people, um, but they will definitely give you a ticket if you are out there fishing without a license. Back to those views. I mean, yeah, last year when pre-running, oh started, map, you know, putting them on the map. Yeah. Right? We'd just come across something, even if it wasn't foliage season yet. But we knew it was just going to be an amazing spot to and, check out. And we add a lot of the really? local knowledge stuff to the map. So not only are you knowing what type of trail this is, what difficulty it is, but what's a, hey, we've marked out there's this amazing cellar hole. Stop, get out, and check it out. Or... This is an epic swimming spot, you know, great swimming hole. Or look, you see a lot of folk art in the woods here. You do. There's a lot of really crazy stone folk art and everything Farm else. turned into art. Yeah, it, uh, it's very artsy culture up here, which is cool. But like, there's a lot to experience along the trails. Um, let's get to the difficulty levels. Yes. So the way... We grade this is with a couple of colors. Green, the way I look at green, anything that is a four-wheel drive vehicle or two-wheel drive with all-terrain tires can do. 
And I mean, like, if you're in a four-wheel drive, you can be on street tires, and this will do it. Like, I'll do it in my 2008 Range Rover. That's how I pre on the greens. There is no risk of recovery. There is really very minimal risk of scratching because it's generally a wider trail, um, that sort of stuff. So, like, anything from, like, a VW bus on up can do it. Then we get to the blues, and the blues, my rule of thumb is, it. the two-wheel vehicles are kind of out, um, unless they're on some pretty aggressive tires, or they really, or they have, you know, a locker, they want to do something, and you should be on all terrains, but you can do it completely aired up, and that's how I, that's how I prove it. Maybe you might have a slight risk of recovery due to, like, a muddy spot, but, like, it's not a proper water hazard. It's not generally right by a beaver dam or something like that. Um, you might have a small rock challenge, but not really risk of body damage sort of things. Like, yes, anyone can do body damage even on the green if you're just doing something stupid or, or you mess up, but it's pretty tame. It's when you start getting into the red, the way I view it, yeah, you should definitely be aired down. There is a risk of recovery so whether you want to have a winch or you're going to be with another vehicle in a kinetic rope um there is a risk of body damage but you can do that without lockers um and do it in i would say the average vehicle the average overlanding vehicle stock height yep. you don't need a lift kit um it would definitely or sliders it would definitely make things easier and possibly cause a little left damage on like the lower sills and stuff but it's not required then the most difficult is pink. Pink is where we get into the stuff that is, I don't want to say lunacy, but it is definitely interesting. And that could be a challenge that is something like our famous crack, which is incredibly technical and can put you on your side. Or it could be something like the pit of despair where, yes, it's not going to damage the vehicle, but you could spend some serious time recovering in there. Yeah. Um, and also pinks may be tighter trails bigger washouts. It is very important there to pick your lines. And with a pink, I would really think about having at least a rear locker. Oh, um, I would absolutely recommend that. You know, like I've done them before in my regular 110, which only had the central locking differential and it, it beat up the truck. It, I did it. I had to winch a bunch of times. Um, it was fun. It would have been a lot more fun with a locker. Um, but there is, Everything for everyone up here. Yes, they're the, I won't say the vast majority, but I'd say at least 50% of the trails are greens. Yep. And then the rest is a good mix of blues, red, and, uh, and the pink. Um, and with the maps this year, for the first time, they'll be in a GPX format. And I, I'm not going to get into that. We'll let Mike do his, who's not here with us today. Uh, he's dealing with, uh, with family stuff. He'll we'll let him introduction to this podcast on how all the maps work because he's our tech god. He's the master of the maps. Let's, guys, if this was me running any of this, you'd be getting messages via carrying pigeon or Derek very, and I barely know our colors. And yeah, we just report them to Mike and I became a pilot, so all I had to do was sign my name. That was literally it. So I didn't have to type. That's why we're doing podcasts and videos because I hate typing. The only thing I hate more is handwriting. <laughs> um, so. This is great. I love talking, though. I'm really good at talking. I'm an excellent talker. Um, but that's that's how the Class 4s are. Come up here, enjoy them, and just have an amazing time. And it is nearly 80 towns worth of Class 4 roads. Yeah. You are never going to be able... We thought about doing a challenge last year of someone who, if they could do all the towns, and there's no way. There's <laughs> no way. It can't be done in the four days. It's just lunacy. I'm not going to encourage it. So there's plenty of stuff to see year after year. And we're always adding stuff. And these roads change. Every year. Every year. Um, I have greens become blues. Blues become greens. Greens become pinks, as we found out last year. <laughs> it's some really interesting stuff, and it's always changing. Um, and that's one of the things I love about the Class 4 roads. And the fact that they are mapped allows us to do this in a safe way. Um, and Vermont, we'll get to the overlanding side, but Vermont overlanding is different because unlike out West, you do not have to bring everything here. Yeah. You don't have to have everything with you. You can provision from general store to general store 
and find the best produce, meats, cheese, you, you know, I think beer. Emily said it best, right? My wife's from Texas. And uh, when uh, she first started exploring Vermont with me, when we moved back here a few years ago, she couldn't believe just every general store had pizza. Oh, yeah. Right? All right. We'd travel and explore. and Or like you know, local steaks, yeah. local ground beef. like, And that's... It's you can just come with an empty core and survive. This is not power to everyone who has vehicles set up for long distance overlanding. Like that is, that's my next step. But I honestly started out as a day tripper here because I live here. So people are like, where's the best off-site camping? And I'm like, I don't know. I live here. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, I just go out and wheel and then I go home. <laughs> so it's, you can come here without having to have a load of camping stuff. Yeah. And even your camping, the thing I love about walking around the event is, you see everything from a, someone who has the basic tent to... LMTVs that are built out with a camper with, bag. With an apartment in it that was yeah. better than any of the apartments I ever rented. Yeah. Um, and the overlanding trailers. That's So on the trailers for the event, we do allow people to bring small adventure trailers. My cutoff is like really that 15, 16 foot mark. You can't come in an Airstream. That's not this type of event. We don't have the room for it. But you can bring one of the adventure trailers that's awesome or rooftop tented or ground tented or be crazy and sleep in a basha shelter right next to the vehicle like i've done or some of the other guys have done um or stay at one of the local airbnbs bed and breakfast there's nothing saying you have to camp you do not have to camp we probably have 20 or 30 people every year that stay at like the woodstock inn um or other airbnbs that the just uniqueness of the airbnbs you can find here too oh yeah yeah awesome you know it could be a room in a house like a really uh, cool farmhouse to a standalone cabin yep. in the middle of the woods uh, it's just absolutely amazing the options that you can find yeah and you can do as, as i said before you can do really with these class four roads you can go wherever yeah. and if you come over to the staff tent in the morning and say hey I want to go look for breweries. We'll help you do that. We'll help you plan a route. Literally, I'll be sitting there, Mike will be sitting there, a couple of the staff guys with the maps on a computer so everyone can see them and plan out a route that covers the activities you want to do within the difficulties level you want to do um, and share our local knowledge. And that's, that's what I love. It's, you're not, you are not at some off-road adventure park. This is literally a magical mystery tour of whatever you want it to be and i am your crazy magical mystery tour conductor <laughs> to help to help guide you along the way um and that that's i couldn't ask for anything more than that this is what makes yeah. it different and this is not a show that's built around vendors either we have some amazing vendors but we heavily curate our vendors to make sure that they really only apply to what we're doing and the heavy focus is on vermont products with a couple uh, overlanding, overlanding type uh, sponsors and vendors who donate some amazing stuff and put into our free raffle. We don't charge for the raffle. You paid to be here. I will not make you pay for a raffle ticket. Same thing when we do the guided stuff. If it is a class workout, you are not paying for our guide service as well there. The only service guide service you'd have to pay for is this year we're partnering up with Orvis and they will be offering some of their fly fishing guiding services at the event, Ooh. which um, is amazing. If you were in fly fishing, um, team up with John and his crew and just go out and do some of the fly fishing along these. These are the local guides. Go out with them, get a mix of the class four roads, bring a lunch and just have some amazing fly fishing up here on some of the Black River, all that stuff gorgeous or do some really off off the beaten path fishing on some of the brooks and all that and that is going to be a new addition to the this year is, is having orvis there with the fly fishing guides which is just awesome um i wish i could take part in that but i will be doing the other things i'm going to take part in that this this summer when i go out with them <laughs> and uh sample their guide services um i think that's pretty good on on the class four roads in the event. Anything else you think we missed with the event? Like, no, it's, it's choose your own adventure. It's yeah. great. That adventure can change three times throughout the day. 
Doesn't um, matter with those maps. You have it right there in front of you. You can pull it up. And now you can do it in different we Mike will Mike will cover in this podcast the different apps. You don't yeah. have to use my Avenza app, which really I inherited from Peter, which was an awesome thing because that was just how the VTrans maps translated. Now you'll be able to do it with in a GPX format. Which is amazing. Um, now you're not switching from like screens to different maps and stuff like that. And it's just mm -hmm. makes it super easy, you know, planning your route, actually building it out. So one more plug because we are releasing the maps on May 15th when most of the class order roads open. When you come up here and you need a place to stay, reach out to Cheryl at Henderson's Hideaway. They always have campsites available. That's right there in South Royalton. That's where we host the event. Um, spend the night there. Take advantage yeah. of these maps. Spend the night there with them. Um, and it, they're kind of being in South Royalton. It's kind of in the center of, or it's kind of really the epicenter of all these class war roads. You is. have the amazing class war roads down to the south. You're not overly far away from the kingdom. Um, so use these maps. It's not like you're just paying for the event. You're kidding. You, you can now cruise the class four roads whenever versus having to wait till the end of the year or well, till just before the event. Um, well, let's move. One of the things we want to do with the podcast is as we interview and co-host other people is talk about the vehicles that they brought. So let's do a little uh, walk around tour of Chris's 110. All right. Tell us the story of first how you got this 110 and how it's evolved from when you got it. Absolutely. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, I used to have a 2001 Nissan Xterra. The main purpose was to get through the snow in the California mountains when I lived out there. Um, moved back to Vermont, made it halfway through the first winter. Uh, and then, yeah, there's a little thing called the timing belt that actually matters. So once that thing died... Um, you know, I'm looking at different options and my wife, you know, she knew that I've just loved the different you vehicles. You coveted my Rovers for a that, long time. Yeah, I have. And I've talked to Derek throughout the years and all the different states so, I've lived in. Backstory, Chris and I grew up together and went to high school together. Um, and, and that's where we knew each other. When we left high school, I went to the Air Force. Chris went to the Army. Different sides of the country, too. I'm in Vermont. And what, you started down in Texas? Texas, then up to Washington. And, yeah, and everything else. So it's only recently you've come back in the last three years. It it's is. It's been three years now? Yeah, this is this is year three. So 2019 or was it 20, 2020? 2020. February 2020. Yep. And it all started when I let you borrow my LR3. Yeah, so <laughs> moved up here. My cars weren't here yet. My wife and I had rented an RV to move across the country. Cars are being shipped. Derek was kind enough to meet us basically day one. And I could borrow his LR3. Um, and man, what a vehicle. That thing was yeah, the LR, fantastic. I, LR3 is big fan of. LR4s, they catch fire. We're going to go, no, we're going to do another podcast. Uh, where vehicles we, on fire. We're going to talk about Derek's experience in vehicles on fire, be it planes or vehicle, <laughs> planes or automobiles. Um, fire extinguishers. Fire extinguishers is a big key. We're going to do another podcast on what should be in your vehicle. I can't. <laughs> I can't plug fire extinguishers enough. <laughs> <laughs> reachable, too. Reachable. Reachable. So, but, you know, after the Xterra died, right, I'm looking at, you know, maybe a small pickup. I got 45 acres. I, uh, you know, I do a lot of stuff on the property. Got my own little dirt roads here. Uh, and Emily was like, you know, you've, you've always wanted one of those Land Rovers. You know, maybe now makes sense. So I started talking with Derek, uh, his friend Andy, you know, started looking in the UK at different options and stuff. And he found this beautiful 1986 uh, XMOD, so X Military um, 110. Normally aspirated 2.5 diesel. That's 68 horsepower in case you're At its best. Yep. That gets about 20 to 25 miles per gallon, really. Mm -hmm. And you have a central locking differential. I do. Yep. You're sitting on, what tires are you on now? Uh, I'm on the Yokohamas. Yep. So, drill lander, mud train. What size? Oh, uh, are you still the 235 85-16s or are you 255s? Yep. Nope, 235s. It's 235s because this came over on original bias ply oh. 7.5 R16s, which were okay. No, no. Remember I had a flat in your oh, yard? Yeah. yeah, they were they were pretty they were pretty old. Yeah. <laughs> so Derek pointed in the right direction for some good tires. Um, so that was probably the first 
That was your first upgrade was getting you tires that didn't just randomly. That was the first thing I give did. up the ghost. Um, since then, I've also become more of a mechanic than I've ever been. Land Rovers will do that to you. Uh, everything from water pump, fuel lifter pump. Most recently, the fuel injection pump. Oh, that, the diesel. You, yeah, the best mod, your diesel heater mod. Yeah. Oh, uh, that is huge. <laughs> um, so if you didn't know, these vehicles have barely enough heat that come out of them naturally to maybe defrost your windows. They were designed for the desert and then the UK where it doesn't really get below 50 degrees. Yeah, so I put in a little diesel heater, 8 kilowatt. Um, sits where my center console would be. Yep. Uh, exhaust out the bottom underneath it along with the fresh air intake. And I got heat running to the back and the front. And uh, wow, what a difference for making this like an all year round vehicle. Yeah, there are ice boxes before. They just, and yeah, there's, you freeze. I did a whole year. One of my, my second ever Rover was a 76 Land Rover Lightweight that had no heat in it. And I did a whole year in the military where I'd get up and leave my house at 5 a.m. and it would be like negative 25 and I'd have to dress like I was going on an Arctic expedition <laughs> to drive to work. It was 24 volt, it started every time, but I had like curtains in it to try to like retain any sense of heat. And I had an ice scraper tied to the inside of my, of my vehicle so I wouldn't lose it because that was the only way to keep going in the winter because my breath would fog over the windshield and freeze. Um, we've come a long way since then. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they were never known for their heat. Um, but it's a cool, they're really capable, cool trucks. It's amazing what this thing does. And, you know, if you added creature comforts besides the heater, got a little awning that comes out the side, put a roof the awning rack on. Ski, the awning ski. Um, you know, because when I'm carrying coolers full of goat cheese and butter, I need to be able to store all my stuff somewhere, so it gets thrown on top. And you've added the winch, so I don't have to kinetic, I have uh, added kinetic the winch. rope recovery that all was the time. one of the best investments, especially when I'm out by myself. Oh, my yeah, goodness. If, if you were going to wheel by yourself um, on the class four roads, I think a winch is the added. Granted, you get away with a come along if you have experience yep. using a come along. I I don't use high lift jacks because I don't have enough training on them. And honestly, they scare the shit out of me. Um, they just, they've seen way too many videos where they go wrong. I'm sure if I had the proper training from the OEX guys, I'd feel more comfortable. But I, I can't see myself ever using it as a winch because it's so terrifying. I've only used it for a snowmobile and that was bad enough. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, the other things that I've done, uh, you know, I got a little goal zero battery box in here with solar on top. Yeah. The solar is the next mod I'm going to be doing on the ambulance. Good mounts for everything from iPod for my Bluetooth speaker to one for a tablet for the maps and then for my phone. Oh, the phone. Yeah. So that's the big thing that I struggled with until I got into actually doing this at a more professional level is those, uh, what is it? The Rhino mount? Yep. The rhino mount that, that thing, is huge it's amazing um i use it in everything from the uaz to the defenders it's secure it's simple it works um it's like 50 bucks yeah on worth amazon it. worth, worth it. its weight in gold um especially when you're trying to navigate with these class four roads um having the ability to have that mounted and not just flying around the cab is huge um the things I added most recently as well are uh, some more underbody product protection. So I got steering guard, steering guard, <laughs> steering guard uh, is key, especially on this vehicle. Uh, yeah, the steering is is not super protected on these one tens, or, yeah. or really the Defender. They're a little more protected on the series trucks, but on the on the one ten nineties, one thirties, the steering guard's nice. It's amazing what can take out your steering. I've taken out my steering twice on the snatch 110 my armored land rover that i cruise around on the trails with because i'm a, i can't I'm tell you how many times i was nervous following derek on trails knowing he had that and i did not yes um, it gives you a little more confidence it, and the steering's just not buried like it is on a modern car no like it doesn't have the plates under it um well talk about your latest your most latest project yeah. your paint job here. yeah so this car came <laughs> over as uh you know military olive drab and i cannot stress how poor the paint jobs were on these british military vehicles so the way the way these work is when in a, in a combat unit they really don't care but what matters to the british army is royal inspections so what happens is they find out that you know princess anne or one of the other royals uh is coming and they say everyone get out the rollers and brushes and repaint the vehicles no they don't deal with spray guns it's 
it is layer upon layer upon layer of paint. It, in this one, I mean, there are parts where it's already like chipping down back to the aluminum. Yeah, um, my ambulance, when I sanded it down, changed color seven times. <laughs> uh, it was everything from Cypress camouflage, which was the green and the tan, to regular Mickey Mouse camouflage, the green and the black, to Arctic or UN white at one time, <laughs> back down to green again, and then to the original bronze green that it rolled off the factory with in 66. Um, so yeah, don't, we don't feel bad about doing these cars with our brushes. And no. Our no, this one, right. After I took off some of the side antennas and stuff like that, that, you know, just, I wasn't using, yep. um, I painted it and it came out like an Andes mint. Uh, <laughs> if you can imagine that kind of green bluish. I your green was not great. And the, the red that you've done now is much better. Well, well, then I switched to a darker green, right? With kind oh, of like you're right. Black. You did add that second green. So then it looked acceptable for sure. Um, and, and we'll post some pictures to go along with this podcast. Yes, of, you could see Of that. the history of Chris's paint jobs. <laughs> yeah. um, right. One thing that I would like to point out that Emily pointed out to me earlier, his wife, is Chris's just lack of taping anything. Yeah. So as we walk back, I've been working a, a lot for not taking Derek. it. He did an amazing job. <laughs> but as we walk back to the license plate, which now has red paint on it, and your wonderful Vermont Creamery sign that now has red paint on it. But what a red, Derek! But what a red! What what a red! I'm amazed at you, how well you actually did without taping. Like your glass is actually amazingly clear. Yeah. It is. Uh, <laughs> But again, it suits, like, this fits in with a vehicle. This is what it is. It is. I, I mean, I know that this vehicle will get scratched up. And it's an aluminum body. You look at it, and the front wings dent. They dent oh, just yeah. by looking at them. I got I got the Derek dents. The Derek dents. Right here from when, you know, I was trying to get around you in that beaver box. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, the ambulance did that. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is still not quite where it should be. Uh, the old wheel fender flare. Well, like, the coolness is the quirkiness and cool fact. Like, yes, we could do this in a modern 2022 Bronco, and there's nothing wrong with that. I could do this with power steering. Power, ste but power steering on, so I have a similar blue version. Well, I don't have it. My wife, Catherine, has a, a 110 that's similar, and she's going to do a walk-around tour of her car and tell the story of that car, which is really interesting um, in our trip to Scotland and many breakdowns along the way. Um, but... It takes a real level of madness, I would say, and... You don't have to pay for a gym membership in the trails. No, you don't have to pay for a gym membership. The Pinsgauer is the worst. <laughs> the Pinsgauer power steering is uh, is really atrocious. We'll get into that when we talk to Brady in one of our upcoming podcasts about his experience with the 712 and how that's evolved. Um, if you, That is hands down the most capable vehicle I've, I've ever seen in terms of just raw ability to, to do stuff. Because it's triple lockers, with, it, it's it's cool. I mean, um, the sex appeal of the driver is without uh, match Bra too. So Brady is timeless. Um, I'm pretty sure he's a vampire because he doesn't age. <laughs> <laughs> and, but this is a really cool rig. Chris has done a wonderful job with it. It's always evolving. Yeah, it is. Um, none of these projects are ever finished. Let's be honest. We're always looking to add something. Or in my case, when I finish one, I sell it, and then I want to build another project. Yeah, um, right. right. And like, again, when it goes back to just that this event is for everybody, I don't have that million dollars. I don't have the $100,000 no. to drop on something. And so it's you can a build come as a, I go. You can come in a daily driver, or you can come in something that you trailer there. One thing we have to say is the vehicles have to be road legal and insured. So they have to have a current plate from wherever you came from. They have to have insurance because... Again, this isn't an adventure park. This is you are cruising regular roads yep. and driving in between them. So that's what kind of makes it a little different. So it's not really an event where you see the stuff that is set up for rock rolling. This is people that are using these rigs for everything from incredible long distance overlands, you know, all through Baja and everywhere else. Or well, Chris and I are planning a trip out west next spring um, to we're just up here for a weekend getaway in Vermont. Like that. Yeah. There's no right or wrong way to do this. The cool thing is you can walk around the event and see all these vehicles. And that's how I get, fun. That's, I, that's where fun I get there. all my ideas and what I'm going to do to my next is seeing someone. I'm like, God, that's such a better way of doing it than I'm doing it. 
Um, particularly with the awnings. Yeah. The uh, I I want to upgrade to a bat wing to the bat wing awning. Um, me just using a Basha shelter and tent pegs to stay dry is not the answer. Um, it's the period correct answer with my old military later hours, but it's not the answer if you want to have a happy wife and children. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a really cool rig. It's got an awesome life up here in Vermont. I think we're doing it. We're doing it right by letting it retire. It's still on the roads. Oh yeah. You know, like this is the ultimate recycling, right? Like this is not, it's not a Prius. It's not a Prius. It's not a Tesla because we're, this is recycling. This this is resigned. Clarkson would be proud of us. I mean, the rest of the world probably isn't proud of us, but like, you know, it's diesel it definitely <laughs> smokes a bit when it's going up a hill and it does not go up a hill fast. No, sorry if you're stuck behind me. But it goes up the hill faster than my diesel. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the walk around. I hope you guys have enjoyed this podcast. I think we'll end it on this note. Thank you for listening to us ramble on for, oh man, we've just hit the hour mark. Oh, wow. Um, Thank you for listening to the Class War podcast. Let us know how we should change it. Chris will be a, uh, a recurring host here um, as he's one of my best friends and also a staff member here at the Pilgrimage. Mike, our, who's going to be joining us, he's not here with us in person, but joining us electronically will also be recurring. And we hope to bring in people like you um, in an interview and talk about anything related to pilgrimage class four roads overlanding in general with a big focus on vermont and new england overlanding because um it, i can't talk about the out west stuff that's not stuff that i did we might bring in someone um like laz or charlie who have done it and they can go into that with their experience but our experience is really just vermont that's that's what we know that's what we love that's why we do this event um and we look forward to talking to you about it. Yeah, hope to see you there. All right, have a good one, everybody. Thank you again for joining us.